Welcome to American Optimist. I'm Joe Lonsdale. I'm excited to have my friend, Dr. Rick Klausner here with us today. Do you prefer Rick or Dr. Klausner for these things? A absolutely, Rick. <laughs> Rick, is, uh, Rick is a legend in, uh, in, the, in the biotech world. He's a renowned scientist and entrepreneur. Uh, he served as a director of National Cancer Institute, right, from 95 to 2001 or so. And you've co-founded multiple companies, uh, including Juno and Grail and uh, Mindstrong and others, and Lyle, of course, which is, which is you know, doing some amazing things people will be hearing a lot about soon. You're, you're actually the, you're a chief medical officer of Illumina early on, too. Mm -hmm. And so, so you've, you've been part of this whole wave of what's going on. A lot of people uh, believe there's sort of a renaissance going on in biology right now. Is, is, that, is that how you'd, how you'd put it, and what, what's, what's happening there? I'm not sure i put it as a renaissance because it didn't die and then get recovered. I think what it really is is that it, it's sort of a hockey stick. I mean, the, uh, we're at what I think will be viewed as truly a revolutionary golden age in life sciences, which is going to have impacts on everything. Not only we think about it as health, but it's going to change how we think about manufacturing, the environment, um, chemistry. Life science is going to be the science that drives this century. And I think we're going to look at this COVID era as the thing that finally you know, tipped us over the edge of recognizing how powerful, how important, how impactful life sciences has become. I think the reasons is, you know, are a couple of things. One, there's just been this acceleration and accumulation of both knowledge and then a whole set of new technologies that are allowing us to view biology and medicine and all of life sciences in, in this comprehensive There's a way. few big breakthroughs that led to what's going on. What, 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 are, what are those breakthroughs? I think, I think the most important breakthroughs has been the ability to read and write DNA, the new ability to actually manipulate and edit DNA, and then I think the convergence of tech and computational sciences and artificial intelligence, machine learning with biology. And, 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 and what, what, when did those breakthroughs happen? Why, why is this happening now and not in 2014 or something? Well, I mean, they, they've been sort of developing over the past decade or two. We've been heading there. But often, you know, things just accelerate. They build on the, themselves. And this phenomenon of conversion, of conversion of tech and other technologies, of, of bas basically, you know, the information revolution with biology is required the sophistication of biology and the sophistication development of, of tech. And so, and, so, and so you've played a pivotal role in a lot of that, This, especially in cell therapies early on. I think you did a lot of research on that long before this acceleration was happening. Can you tell us a little bit more about CAR-T and cell therapies and what's happening there? Sure. I mean, the CAR-T therapy stands for chimeric antigen receptor T cells. It's where we arm T cells with literally a guided missile in order to try to cure certain types of cancer. And it's actually been incredibly successful for blood cancers. Not yet for the solid tumors, we can talk about that, but for blood, blood cancers. And it really began in the early 1980s. It actually began when my lab, when I was still in the lab, discovered how immune cells are actually turned on. And we discovered the molecular machinery. And a friend in Israel had this idea of using those discoveries to develop this therapy to attack tumors. I had no idea that we can use that information to attack tumors. We tried it in the early 1980s. It was the first time we made cars, and it didn't really work. And it took a few more decades to understand more about how to keep T cells activated. It, did, it didn't work because they got deactivated somehow. Because the they turned on and they immediately turned off. And we had to learn to keep them on long enough to eradicate the tumors. But over the last five years, through a number of companies in particular, such as Juno, Kite, Novartis, there are now drugs on the market that are curing people with end-stage incurable hematologic malignancies like lymphoma, leukemia, myeloma, with this now one-time curative therapy. It's really a revolution. I mean, I actually think about uh, the last hundred years of scientific medicine as having three phases. One, birth the, the pharmaceutical industry, where we learned to take natural products, drugs like penicillin. And that was the pharmaceutical These industry. These are molecules coming from things. These are nature. molecules generally coming from the natural world, from bacteria and fungi. Um, and, and we made statins and all these incredible drugs. That was the pharmaceutical industry. About 40 to 50 years ago, we learned to capture the types of molecules that our cells make, 
mostly proteins, and create protein-based drugs. That was the revolution called the biotech industry. I think we're at the very beginning of the third, maybe even final phase of scientific therapies, which are living cells as drugs. So we're programming the cells as a machine to go in and handle and, things. And then they're alive. They dose themselves. They seek out where they need to be. They determine how long they need to be there, when they go away. It's absolutely so, so the original version of this may, might be said to be what Kite and Juno did with the CAR-T where they, they were able to kill some blood cancers by programming the white blood cells to hunt them out. Is there a V2 or a V3 going on? What are the other, what's the more complexity happening? Yeah, so now what we're doing with that, we now know it works. We know we had to, had to manufacture cells to be, to be drugs, to be approved by the FDA. And now what we need to do is learn to reprogram cells so they do exactly what we want. They overcome the barriers that we haven't overcome with the first generation. And I think that's gonna give us the second and third generation that's gonna dramatically expand the number of diseases that we can think of. Are there about a few cures. examples of, of tech that's happening right now? You're seeing, I know you're involved obviously in Sonoma, which uses Tregs to, to do things. Are there, what, what does that mean? Are there, is that a big one? Yes, that, I think that is gonna be big. I think Sonoma is this company that, um, so there are two types of T cells. The T cells that attack other cells, that sort of kill things, get rid of tumors if they can, and infections, that's what it's from. Those are called T effector cells. And there's another class of T cells that regulate the T effector cells. And those cells, when they're not active enough, is the basis for all autoimmune disease, like type one diabetes, and many other autoimmune diseases, maybe even neurodegenerative diseases, which are, we now think are autoimmune. So it's one of the now, early areas in life we need more regulators, you're saying. We need more regulators, <laughs> that's right. Outside of Washington, more regulators in our body, and, and what, what Sonoma and others are trying to do is to copy what we did at Juno and Kite and arm now Tregs to now shut down an overactive immune system in these autoimmune diseases. Because because then because an autoimmune disease your immune system is attacking yourself you want to you want to quiet it down and you need to quiet it down and, and so you can actually program these things to go in there and, and do that the right way and you're programming them to go to the right place if you have an autoimmune disease in the in the in um, the uh, liver it should go to the liver if you have it in the pancreas for diabetes it should go there if you have it in joints for rheumatoid arthritis it should go to the joints and that's what these CAR T reg cells are going to be able to do. Now, I don't know what else you're allowed to talk about here, but I know there's something that's going on with CAR-T where, for example, you can attack tumors potentially because tumors are turning these things off. Now you can. I know there's something going on where you could make the white blood cells go back to as they were when they were younger and they're more effective. Are there, are there things like that you could tell us about that you're working on? Well, I think, I think what many of us have seen over the past couple of years, we, we've asked the question, oh, it works so fantastically in blood cancers. Why doesn't it work in solid tumors? And over the last few years, we think we've learned why, what those barriers are. And over the last maybe one to three years, there are new ways to overcome those barriers. So I think the next big breakthrough in, in curative therapy is going to be curative therapy for any solid tumor by getting these T cells to have the properties that allow them to, to stay active even in solid tumors, which have the ability, maybe why they exist is because they have the ability to turn off the immune system. And, and you can we can overcome you can program them not to turn off. But if they don't turn off there, they might not be turned off other places too, so they could be more dangerous. Well, they could be, but at the same time, you specifically target them to only see the tumor cells. So, you know, the, the two T cells that are capable of being active, if they don't see their target, just sit there. And, and is there, what's the rate right now of toxicity where CAR T's accidentally hurt people? It's pretty small right now. Well, there are some side effects, but now mostly we know how to deal with them. They're transient. Um, with Juno, we were able to make these CAR T cells where almost everyone is treated as an outpatient. They don't even have to go into the hospital. Wow, really? And, and, and I, 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 I know we had one person on our network who they're, they're, they're unfortunately, they're, one of their relatives had a cytokine storm in response. Yes. That, 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 that's, that's, that's very rare, though. It's not that it's that rare. It, it was relatively common because we didn't know how to, how to choose the right dose. It's really just a dose effect. And as we've learned to get the right dose of these CAR T cells very quickly, within a few years of introducing them, those side effects have become really quite manageable. Got it. And so, and so, and so given now you're going to be able to attack tumors in these new ways, 
I, do you expect cancer to be something that's much less common 10 years from now? What's the, what's the timeline on this and, and how, how is how's it going to change society? Well, I mean, we haven't shown, we and others haven't yet shown that those barriers that we can overcome so are think, the right barriers. So you think you figured so it out, but you're we, just we think we, But you never yeah. know until you try it in patients. Yeah. It's going to be tried in patients over the next year or so. If we are right scientifically, I think I think we can be thinking about seeing the beginning of the end of cancer. That's amazing. So that's amazing. So not only will the investors make ten billion dollars, tens of billions of dollars, but more importantly, you're gonna you're gonna save We're millions gonna of save lives. Save millions of lives. That's extraordinary. As you, as you know, I lost my mother and, and my mother-in-law to, to, to cancer. So this is one where we're very excited to fix for our girls. Uh, maybe stepping back a little bit, I want to ask you about the big picture on the role of of government and of business in what you're doing. You you ran the National Cancer Center, so you obviously know a lot about what government's doing. And then you went and you built these businesses that were very effective at doing things that, that were not able to be done necessarily by government. Uh, obviously, there's there's a role for each. Like, what, what is the right role for government and for business? And, 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 and how, how do we have them work together to, to solve these problems? I, I think the right role for government in this sort of science is, is to support very undifferentiated basic science. That's the pr that, that sort of is the foundation for now the ability to create entities that are really good at taking that and turning them into medicines, drugs, new diagnostics. That's what the private sector is incredibly good at doing. But there is a need to support universities that just explore things, that find things like CRISPR, uh, this amazing new gene editing that came from looking at weird sequences in, in strange bacteria. Yeah, Jennifer Dowd now is studying bacteria and immune systems, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. They didn't even yeah. know it was an immune system. They didn't even know. They're so just they, looking at why. They're just looking at why were these strange yeah. things there. And that's what government is really good at doing, as doing this where, where you actually don't know. You sort of, you know, it's it's sort of so the, so we the need, soil. We need money to keep supporting basic science in our society. That's what I think we need. But 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 industry is extraordinary at at taking that and and making sure that it's it's translatable, and then translating it. Um, this company that I found called Grail is a great example of, of that, um, and and this is a really interesting example. When uh, Grail is a company where we figured out how to create a universal blood test for the early detection of any cancer. You're looking at cell-free DNA. We're looking at what's called cell-free DNA, little fragments of DNA that circulate in our blood. And turns out we learned over about four years with over a billion and a half dollars of private investment to figure that out. Could the government have done that or just government doesn't spend a billion dollars trying something? I was something? asked that by a candidate for president called Joe Biden when he heard about the results that Grail presented at a cancer meeting. He called me. Yeah. And he asked me explicitly, could you have done that if you were still running the National Cancer Institute? And I believe the answer is no. It's extremely hard to aggregate all of those resources and to create the type of completely mission-driven venture. You need, in, you need to get the top talent and then having it upside and working a certain way. And it has to things. work a certain way. And, and it has to work in terms of everyone coming together towards a singular goal. That's not what... I could have done. It's too big of a risk for Institute. government to put a billion and a half into something too, right? Yes, they, they because and, and everyone would be arguing, well, I'm not getting my grant, I'm not getting my grant. Um, yeah, they'd but, all be attacking it basically. Yeah, they, yeah. yeah, we'd still be having advisory sessions. <laughs> You'd still be doing the, the committee meetings. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so Steve Steve Jobs says that you don't get a you don't get if you want to design a horse and you try to have a committee do it you're going to get a camel instead. Is yeah, that, or, or at best a camel. At best a camel. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's true. And so and so 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 grill need to be done privately. But was was there there was some basic research maybe from some point in the past obviously that grill that made grill possible because because absolutely in fact that came from an obscure paper that was published in French in 1947 when some amazing person noticed that there was DNA floating in the blood yep. and it took a long time for academics to think that well you know that may reflect disease and we 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 jumped on that I but but the interesting thing is and I think it's really exciting you know 50 years ago. There was no biotech industry. Yeah. There weren't these companies. And I think that was a very constrained ecosystem, largely entirely academic, entirely funded by the government. It had to be at first. It had to be at first. Yeah. But now it's a much healthier ecosystem. And the private sector, private investment, risk-taking 
is an unbelievably there, important. There seems part. to be a lot of infrastructure in the private sector too, right? There's tools that all of our companies use that you know and also, scale. Like Illumina, which you helped, obviously was necessary for Grail. To, Absolutely, to, to work. We, there was no way to even imagine Grail without Illumina, which 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 is inexpensive sequencing. You know, so in a, a lot of your companies, uh, they raise billions of dollars, which is you know, as coming from the technology world when we're building tech companies, a lot of them. You don't you don't need sometimes more than tens or 100, 200 million. Not that 200 million is not a lot, but but it's but it's a lot lot less. You'll you'll do you'll raise 10, 20 x after your companies. Why why do they need so many billions of dollars? What's going what's going on there? Mostly because of the expense of doing clinical studies. For Grail, we had clinical trials that involved over 150,000 participants, and those are really expensive. You know, it could be ten you know thousand to ten thousand dollars per individual. And without doing that, you you know you have all these ideas. You can't know you're right until you develop the clinical evidence. And that's why biotech is so much more expensive. It's also highly regulated. That's part of it. But I think the major expense is how expensive it is to move science into testing and people. So, 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 and so there's obviously a lot of smart people in the FDA. If you were if you were the dictator of the FDA, are there things you would change about this to make it faster and easier to, to do these trials? Well, yes and no. And here's the interesting thing. I think the FDA, they made some stumbles, but over the past year with COVID, they moved fast. They moved incredibly fast. You know, And what I'm hoping is that we look at ourselves, we look at the FDA, we look at the NIH of what happened during COVID and not go back to the risk averse way it was before. So they're capable of moving very fast and being very creative. A, a, a lot of my friends working with them who are building things thought that they would defer to working with the bigger companies first. It was very difficult to, to get in when they had something new and it took, took longer. Is that is that a fair criticism or have you not seen I that? I haven't found that. I, 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 found I that. haven't found that. I mean, with companies that I've started, we engage the FDA very quickly. They're interested in the science. And they, you know, like with, with cell therapy, they were incredibly helpful. That's great. That's great. In, uh, I guess, are there, I guess maybe stepping back, talking about future and optimism, are there, are there new areas you're working on that you're really excited about? What are you most excited about now? Obviously, I think curing, curing cancer is pretty good. So we already, we covered the, you know, that area. What, what else are you optimistic about right now? I, I think, I think I'm getting interested in what I think is the biggest mystery of life in biology, which is why we age. And there's been an explosion, early and quiet, of research building up over the past 20 years that actually tells us that hidden within every cell, it looks like, is the ability to turn back the clock. This has something to do with fertility, right? Well, yes. I mean, in fact, once you realize this, you realize there always had to be a back door of rejuvenation or else our species would have a shorter and shorter lifespan yeah. after any generation. So after fertilization, the clock is reset. So cells are able to do that. And the ability to imagine understanding and controlling that would be the biggest revolution in medicine, health, maybe even society that humanity has ever experienced. I, I know you've, you've talked about uh, Yamanaka's research. Is, is, is there anything there you, you could share that? Well, yes. So Yamanaka won the Nobel Prize about 15 years ago when he showed a, the, one of the most remarkable things that I've ever seen in my career. In some sense, even more remarkable than the double helix. We knew we were going to figure out DNA. We knew we were going to. What we there was no way to predict what Yamanaka found, which is that every organism develops, you know, from a single cell to what you and I look like. Incredible, and it's it's a film that's run forward. Yeah. No one ever imagined you can run the film backwards. Yamanaka basically showed us that you can run the film backwards. You can take any cell from any age, from any part of the body and reprogram it to go all the way back to zero age and zero state and this is this is using the ep identity. epigenetic memory somehow on the cell? Well, it, it using... actually, he was using four transcription factors, four proteins that drive how the DNA is read out of the genome. We actually still, even after 15 years of studying, you know, we don't even know exactly why they work. Is it like just triggering a certain part of the genome? Or it is... must be triggering a program yeah. that exists. I think that's the big mystery now. And then what's happened over the past three or four years is that people, but remember, Yamanaka said at the same time you turn the clock back, 
you also turn the identity back to just this. To pluripotent stem cell. To pluripotent stem cell. Stem cell. Stem cell that could be anything it wants to be. Right. And, you know, that's not very useful for us. You know, we. But, you you could, know, but then you could turn it back into a white blood cell well, or something. Well, you can. You can. Yeah. And that's getting better and better. And that's important for regenerative medicine. Yep. But not necessarily. Yeah, but if you want to be younger, I can't just turn my brain into a massive pluripotent stem And then cells. hope it comes back. That wouldn't be very safe. But over the last few years, a number of scientists have figured out amazingly how to manipulate the Yamanaka factors to dissociate the resetting of the age clock from the loss of cell identity. Wow. I think we're going to look back on that as perhaps the most important striking set of discoveries of So you could potentially science. you could potentially take any part of your body and, and reset reset those cells to be could you could you could you go back to 21 or do you got all the way back to 5? Like, we don't know that yet. Yeah. We don't know that yet. The early studies actually suggest that when you rejuvenate cells this way, they sort of go back to the end of development, sort of the, you know, around so 15, 15, you know, 12 to 20, somewhere huh. between puberty and the end of development. And there seems to be a, a little barrier there, which may be good. Um, if you could be any age again, what age would you want? Well, I wouldn't to want to be in eighth grade, for sure. <laughs> um, but, you know, I wouldn't mind being in my 20s, not, not intellectually, but in terms of health, I mean... There's not a lot of 20 and 30 years old that fill our hospitals. There's going to there's be a good question there, though, with our brains, right? Because a lot of our health is tied to our brains. And the question is, can you change the brain back being younger without somehow losing some something in it? Or there's emerging data really suggesting that you can do that. It's, it's very early, wow. but that you can do that. I mean, and there's, there's so many interesting things emerging now. I think this is going to be the hottest area of science in the history of biologic science. There's a lot of people kind of assume, uh, you know, our friend Elon talks and others, like, they kind of assume it's like a cyborg is going to be the future where we use where we use people and machines. But but if this is true, you don't need any kind of cyborg stuff. You just still be a total That's a person I'm, who's younger. Yes, yes. Now, what whether that changes health span versus lifespan, we don't know yet. That's interesting. And, you know, I mean, it's very interesting. My will be, I used to say when I was running the NCI that our goal in medicine is for everyone to die young after a long time. And, you know, so whether what we're going to do is turn things into you get to 120, 130, and there's this sort of... It may be the case we can't still extend it too much past 130, 150, who knows. But, right. but, but, you, but if you can live like a 25-year-old up into most of that, that's not too bad. That is not bad. That's fascinating. Because well, they, they, they used to they used to always say science only advances by, by the death of certain people. Some people would be very worried if, 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 if death itself was gotten rid of. Well, there's a good argument that you'd, ha you'd have trouble having evolution without death. You might have to send the old people off to Mars or something. Well, but now they'll be able to, you know, be healthy enough for long enough to actually go to Mars or that's, beyond. That's awesome. That's awesome. And, and uh, is it like, like what's, what's the best way to pursue this? People have to get money together and do research. We got to get the science out. right. I mean, yeah. I mean, we're at the very beginning of the science, and we gotta, we got to master the science. It's going to be very complicated. I think it's going to be one of the great and biggest challenges because I think it's the biggest mystery about biology, which is, you know, why do we age? And we can sort of accept it as that it's obvious. Of course, we age, but actually, it's not obvious. And that Yamanaka saying we can run the film backwards to me changed everything. Do you do you think this is relevant to people who are uh, alive today and they're? 40s, 50s, 60s, potentially, in terms you know, of what's going to happen. You know, you know, the usual thing that you say about science or anything is that we always overestimate what we can do with the next year, and we always underestimate what we can do in 10 years. So that's all I can say. And and and, and stay stepping back again, role of government, role of business. This is one of those things you probably need to put several billion dollars into. The government's not going to be able to take the full bet itself. Is this a business thing? Is it also tied to basic research government supporting? Is it both? Well, I wonder whether it needs a sort of new model that picks that picks the best from what we've learned to do with free academia, academic research and mission-based research. Uh, I, I think we need new models. And this seems like the kind of thing a lot of people probably would be likely to want to support, obviously. So but they have to have the patience. Here. To not, you know, to, to, to get it right. Is it, is it an endeavor over a generation? It's I think it's, a, I mean, it's, I think we have to be willing for it to be an endeavor over the generation. But, you know, a lot of things move faster than we thought. Uh, Francis Crick, one of the co, the Nobel laureates for co-discovering the structure of DNA, he died of colon cancer. And I, I was involved with that. And I remember asking him at the end of his life, when they figured out DNA in 1953, how far did they think we would be in our knowledge about this by the year 2000. 
And he said, well, we thought by the year 2000, maybe we'd figure out the genetic code. We figured that out in 1960. Wow. And what he says, like, it was unimaginable how fast it's gone from that moment in time. I don't think we're very good at understanding the speed with which that's amazing because a lot of people criticize our society and say that oh sci-fi thought we'd be doing all sorts of different more advanced things in the 50s but in some ways we've 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 far exceeded what sci-fi anticipated in certain areas like this no absolutely i mean the major thing we didn't do was flying cars yet i mean you know everyone says that we're working on joby aviation is getting exactly exactly (laughs) and and that you know but but actually overwhelmingly i think you know, if you take away some of those things that were in, you know, you know, scientific magazines or science fiction magazines, I think we've completely outrun the imagination that people had in the 50s and 60s of where we would be. Maybe not quite as many space hotels. Maybe yeah. not quite as many, but boy, everything else. I mean, yeah. Everything else. And, and, I, and, and so a lot, of, a lot of our audience, I want to ask you a couple of questions, are investors, and they're really excited about investing and trying to push this field forward. That's something I'm obviously excited about by putting money into this and helping these people. Um, what's a helpful framework for investors to turn to when evaluating bio-research, biotech company? Like, like how should they be approaching this? Well, the first thing is to, is to invest in people and be able to figure out, you know, who are really credible people, not selling fantasies. Because in biology, that doesn't work. Sometimes fantasies do work when you're just trying to get behavior to change with consumer stuff. You can have just this vision. Yep. That doesn't work in biology. And so the, 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 what you sell is not as important, I think, for investors as being able to really suss out who are those scientists that are able to manage that boundary between the unimaginable and the completely credible. So it's really, it's really the people and the scientists and the science. It's- That's what I think. And, and a lot of people are very wary of this area because these phase three trials are so expensive and they take so long. And so like, like how, how should people approach that risk? You've been able to man- raise billions of dollars for things you're doing and you're very good at that. Is, 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 do you have to bet on people who are going to be able to raise a huge amount of money or, or, or how does that work? You know, I, I think big problems take a lot of money. There's, there's no question. This, and this, what I'm describing is maybe the biggest of all problems. And it's going to take lots of people working on it. But, you know, I don't think we know yet whether it takes – Decades. I mean, I actually think if we stop thinking about aging and start thinking about the the properties of cells that are young, we can rejuvenate cells in a couple of days. And as we learn to measure what this quote young healthy cell looks like, it's it's not about having to ask whether people don't age as much over four decades. It's about the types of of measurements that we can do with rapid clinical trials. But that takes a new sophistication about the deep biology. So it seems like there's going to be a lot of things that can come out of this, just like CRISPR has so many companies to come out of it. This is going to have so many companies. So how, what, what, what are the biggest risks for, as an investor to approach this? Or what should people be thinking about? What should they be learning about if they want to get involved? I, I, I think the biggest risk is going to be you know, following sort of false profits of science that basically promise, I mean, and this field of aging in particular has been filled with that, that sort of stuff. That, and and it's, it's getting to the thing that this is not about, you know, um, I don't know, the sort of uh, superficial, you know, are you wrinkled, are you gray? It's about understanding the deep biology, the deep, which we don't yet know. People are gonna wanna spend money on the wrinkle and, and they, gray they, thing. Yeah, they yeah. will, they will. But, it, but actually it's gonna be, you know, like with early gene therapy, there'll be surprising dangers and pitfalls. It's all about understanding how do you think about the deep scientific questions and investing in that. That makes sense. There's a, there's a lot, of, I guess, the fountain of youth. What was it? It was a Vasco da Gama in the 15th century. Yep. It took, yep. It took a little bit longer than you thought, but we, we could get there in the 21st century, yeah. potentially. It, it was actually Ponce de Leon. It was a Ponce de Leon. But, but Vasco da Gama go. maybe had a, had a, it had a way Vietnam. around yes, There you go. I got it wrong. I got it wrong. <laughs> a way to the fountain of youth. <laughs> <laughs> Ponce, that's very good. It's Ponce de Leon. That was, was that the late 15th century that you said? It, it was or? the late 16th century. Late 16th century. He was in 1570 or something like that. You, you know, your, Lyle is named after a 19th century scientist. You study the history of science a little bit. I do. I love it. Uh, what, 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 how, how does that inform your work when you, obviously what you're doing is you're creating the future of science. You're creating the future of history. So, 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 that, so is that helping you in some well, way? Well, I've been obsessed with how do you think new thoughts? I mean, we're all so totally overwhelmed with the baggage of our language and what we think we know and what everyone tells you we know. And I'm fascinated by people like Lyle and Darwin 
Newton, um, you know, that, that thought new things. I mean, and, and how did they free themselves to, to, to reframe things? And I loved Lyle in particular. Um, and, and tell, tell us who Lyle is. So Lyle is considered the father of geology. And, and to understand this is that, you know, there have been sort of three forbidden sciences of the past 500 years. First was astronomy, because this threatened religion. And Galileo. And Galileo, exactly. Um, and yeah, he had, the, he had the equivalent of the, of the woke people after him at that time. Exactly. He certainly Christians. did. The religious woke people. Yeah, there you go. But the next forbidden science was geology. When people started asking, wait a second, why does the earth look the way it does? And to, as a question, as opposed to, well, God made it that way. Why are there mountains? Why are there rivers? Why does it look the way? And Pascal was one of the first that started asking this. And Lyle was the one who had this incredible epiphany, which he did just, he loved walk, walking around the Scottish countryside. He was trained as a, as, as a lawyer. And he loved, he would describe, after a rain, he would look at these little rivulets. And he'd look at it and he goes, you know, that looks like a river, only tiny. And he just had this insight that what if the world isn't the biblical 5,200 years old? What if small changes over huge expanses of time could completely reshape even what the earth looks like? And, 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 and that's, that was the origin. The start of, of geology. And Darwin, in his biography, says, Lyle gave me the gift of time. So Once I, he realized there's enough time for evolution, then he could think about that. Without time, you couldn't. And, and so I'm just sort of fascinated by how do people make those leaps where they're suddenly freed from this constraint, in this case of time. Are you ever concerned that the, the danger and fate of some of these earlier scientists could befall people who are working on these types of problems today? Oh, for sure. So there could be some controversy on oh, these things. There will always be controversy. We got, we got to educate people about the positives. So. I think that's right. And yet still people will be worried about unintended consequences, which there always are. And yet what do we do? We move forward. Awesome. Well, it definitely seems worthwhile to move forward. And Rick, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Always good to talk to you, Joe.